my name is Emily Bynan and today I'm going to talk about Voliere. Voliere from Carnival of the Animals by Saint-Saëns is a fun, light piece for ensemble, subtitled Grand Zoological Fantasy. Now one of Saint-Saëns' most famous pieces, he himself considered it so light he didn't actually want it published or performed during his lifetime. He thought it too silly. But for flute players doing orchestral auditions, I know that the last thing this can sometimes feel like is fun and light. So what I set out to do in this video today is to help you get to know all the corners and opportunities provided in this excerpt so that by the time you go into your audition, you love this excerpt the most. Above all else, do bear in mind that this should sound easy and effortless. Remember that most of the panellists probably won't be flute players and will have no idea how tricky this one is. Let's keep it like that. And if you've not played this in concert, take it from me, it might actually almost feel easier to play in an audition than in a concert performance, for two main reasons. Firstly, the tempo. In an audition, you can choose your tempo. But in a concert, the difference between, say, 72 and 84 for the double bass player playing the pizzicatos at the beginning is minuscule. But for us, it can feel like almost the difference between life and death, certainly the difference between managing and not quite managing. The other reason it might feel slightly easier in an audition than in a concert is that, of course, you don't have to wait in an audition. You're, hopefully, well in the flow by then. When you're playing it in an ensemble though, you might be sitting there on stage without being able to play a note for 15 or maybe even 20 minutes, depending how long the script is, having only played the aquarium beforehand. And to add insult to injury, the clarinet number just before this one has only two notes. That wretched cuckoo. start by asking why this excerpt is asked for orchestral auditions. The movement lasts about a minute and at first sight we might think it's purely about articulation and finger technique. But let's look again to see what else there is to find and what other opportunities there might be. Saint-Saëns gives us very little in terms of dynamic contrasts. It's simply marked piano at the beginning and there are those two hairpins, crescendo diminuendo. So the way you phrase and tell a story will give the jury a very good idea as to what sort of imagination you have as a musician. The person who will impress the panel the most is the one who will be able to lift this mass of notes from the page and bring them to life effortlessly like the flapping of tiny bird's wings. Of course, virtuosity and control are important as are a good sense of rhythm and convincing balancing out of the registers. Saint-Saëns marks the movement moderato grazioso, moderate and graceful. And whilst in a performance it might go a little faster, for an audition I think that aiming for a tempo around 72 or 76 will be plenty fast enough to show your virtuosity without risking losing any clarity or control. In my opinion, the lightness comes from the dynamics, the phrasing and the sound, not from the speed or the staccato. Now, voliere means aviary, so once again we're in birdland. Us flute players spend so much of our musical lives representing birds, don't we? Well, I can think of worse fates. Now, an important anatomical fact which can help us playing this piece is that birds have light, hollow bones to be able to fly. So when it comes to phrasing, let's see where we can release the sound, musically drawing inspiration from those hollow bones. So I would suggest the microphrasing in the first bar of four notes diminuendo and four notes crescendo. I really don't mean an accent on each beat. I mean a lifted release in the middle of each group of eight notes. In the second bar, however, I would sustain the sound so as to show your healthy low register, then a pronounced diminuendo up to the top A to show total command of the dynamics of the instrument across the entire range. Now let's look at the macro phrasing of the first eight bars. 
we have four pairs of bars and I would suggest that the third pair of bars, figure one, where the harmony changes, is the loudest or the most open phrase. So I would give a little crescendo at the end of the second pair of bars into that third phrase and then close down the fourth phrase and the very first phrase with a little diminuendo. Four bars before figure three and two bars before figure three look quite similar. So again, I think we could really make something of the phrasing here. Personally, I would let that first chromatic scale disappear into nothing. And then the second chromatic scale, I would open the phrase out with a little crescendo into figure three. In terms of articulation, we're generally looking for a light stroked detaché rather than a short spiky staccato. There are actually surprisingly few bars marked with staccato dots. Practice it first legato, then in flutter tonguing, and finally with a relaxed tongue, gently disturbing the airstream, not more. At figure two, show those syncopated repeated A's clearly with a light fast diminuendo on each note within the crescendo diminuendo hairpin of the whole bar. In the third bar of figure two, to help redress any balance issues with this two octave jump, my suggestion would be to play the low notes a little stronger and longer and the top D's quite light and short. Now, of course, we shouldn't sound like a pirate with a wooden leg. The end result to the listener should be even pairs of notes, but in order to achieve that, help the lower notes slightly by giving them more sound and length and letting the top Ds take care of themselves somewhat. At figure three, I would open the first pair of bars with a tiny crescendo and then close the second pair with an equal and opposite balancing diminuendo. Two bars before figure four give lots of direction into that first vertical accent and then a quick diminuendo from the low D flat to the top D flat. Similarly, the next two bars give plenty of direction, which means crescendo, towards the D natural, then a diminuendo down to the low D. This is not the moment to show off your fabulous low register. E flat, of course, rises chromatically, suggesting that this bar is a little bit louder, but still with a diminuendo to the second beat. E natural is a step higher and probably louder again, and once more, a nice diminuendo into the second beat. The last three bars are self-explanatory. At last, Saint-Saëns gives us a strong guideline. Now, there are several misprints, many of which are obvious, but I just want to mention them here to be sure. Firstly, at figure two, after the rest, the first note should be a quaver or eighth note. Then in the fourth bar, this scale should be a full chromatic. The B flat is missing on the last beat, but do play it, it is in the score. At figure three, the first two notes are printed with a slur in the flute part, but that doesn't actually appear in the score or in the manuscript. Personally, I think it's quite nice to do it, but just be aware that it's not officially printed. Finally, three bars before the end should have a slur over this whole bar as well as the staccato dots. It's in the score and in the manuscript, but is missing from the flute part. Now, there are several places where I use fake fingerings. In the first bar, I play one proper E, and then for the middle two E's, I use the trill fingering. Because I suggested lifting the middle of each of these groups, that diminuendo crescendo within each beat, it's important to make sure that the air speed is fast enough to still give clarity on those fake fingerings. On the third beat, whilst I lift my left hand second finger for the D normally, I wouldn't worry about the D-sharp key for the E natural. Similarly, don't worry too much about the D-sharp key on the second beat of the second bar. At figure one, I again use a trill fingering for the F, but make sure that the air speed is fast enough and that the quality of sound is good enough for no one in the audience to know. So really take a little time to put each fake note under the microscope and polish it up so that it's almost inaudible in context. As always, it's imperative that the rhythm is accurate. And in this excerpt, the trap that many of us fall into is not counting the rests out fully. 
For example, two bars before figure two, make sure that the second beat isn't early here. And make sure that the third bar after figure two doesn't start too early as well. Those rests at the end of the second bar will feel very long when you've been playing so many notes per second beforehand. And in the very last chromatic run, keep the control and keep it exactly in tempo. Just bear in mind that on the second beat we have a C sharp, so a strong beat with a very weak fingering. So make sure that you don't let that slip away too fast. And speaking of fingers going too fast, in the first eight bars we spend so much time working on the tricky, awkward finger movements that our fingers actually become quite fast when we're practicing this excerpt. And I think there's actually a danger that they are going too fast on the easy moments. The FGA, one and three bars before figure one, and also the GAB in the second and fourth bars of figure one. There it might be a question of keeping your fingers slow enough. So when you're playing this in an audition, find the ease and the lightness. This is a character piece where you can really show your musicality to great effect. It's not about traumatic technique. Find a way to fly through it with the grace and ease of a bird. I hope you've enjoyed this. See you next time.